Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. All right, we're ready to begin. Just a brief show of hands. Uh, we've been doing this. Is this way too loud, or is that okay? Okay, it feels like a lot of echo. We've been doing this. Uh, Michael and I started a Messianic Prophecy Yeshiva back in October. No, back in September, I believe. And so we did September, October, and we took off November. Or, and then here we are back again in December. Just a brief show of hands. Who was uh, at the first two? So a handful of people. Okay, so today I wanted to do a little bit of kind of introductory background, retracing some of our steps um, in the very beginning. Who has a Bible with them? <laughs> I made sure this time to not put all of the scriptures on the PowerPoints because there's some things that I think you really have to see in your own Bible for it to really hit home of some cool stuff in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Torah. And so if you have your Bible, just before I go into the intro, just so we're all in the same place, if you go to Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2, and I actually did not plan this along with Vladimir's uh, teaching on the Nativity, but Matthew chapter 2 is, of course, uh, going into the birth narratives of Yeshua. And I'm intimately acquainted with Matthew chapter 2 and fascinated with Matthew chapter 2 uh, because I did my master's thesis on one verse in Matthew chapter 2. So when I was finishing my master's degree, I spent literally six or seven months writing just on this one verse in the birth narratives, in the nativity story, as it were. And it has some of the most uh, fascinating gateways, the beginning of Matthew, some of the most fascinating gateways of how does Matthew understand uh, Yeshua? How does Matthew understand Yeshua in relation to Israel? And especially, how does Matthew use the Old Testament uh, prophecies from the Hebrew Bible? And this is some, it's, it's very fascinating once we get into it. But first, just to set the stage, I just want to read uh, the account at the beginning of Matthew, this I'll start in Matthew 2, 13. And so it says, Now when they, which is the Magi, had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. And remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. This is all very familiar. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. And then Matthew says this amazing thing. He says, this was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. Does anyone know off the top of your head where Matthew is quoting from? Where the Old Testament is quoting, where Matthew is quoting from the Old Testament? He's, yeah, he's quoting from Hosea chapter 11, 1. How many times when you're uh, reading through the New Testament and you come to an Old Testament quotation, let's just be honest, because I don't always do it, do you stop and uh, say, okay, the New Testament author is quoting the Old Testament here, so to really understand what he's saying, I have to go back to the Old Testament, hunt down what it's saying in the Old Testament in context, and then I'll really be able to understand what he's saying. I don't always do that. <laughs> A lot of times I think we just kind of read straight through. And uh, this particular quotation here in Matthew 2.15, when he says, 
This was to fulfill what, the, what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. This is one of the most, I guess you could say, controversial citations of the Old Testament in the New Testament. So a lot of people, for example, if you're doing Jewish evangelism or looking at scholarship even from uh, Jewish scholars, a lot of people will point to Matthew 2.15 where Matthew quotes Hosea 11.1 1 as fulfilled in the life of Yeshua. A lot of people will point to this and say, this proves that the New Testament does not use the Old Testament responsibly, right? So basically, Matthew and the apostles, what they were doing was they were just grabbing scriptures out of context, whether it's from Isaiah or whether it's from Hosea or whether it's in the Torah. They were just grabbing scriptures out of context and twisting them to make them somehow apply to Yeshua. Does that make sense? And so right there, the whole argument that Yeshua is the promised Messiah from the Hebrew Bible, in their mind, it starts to lose validity. And in Jewish evangelism, that's obviously one of the most important things is, is Yeshua the promised one of the Hebrew Bible? And does the New Testament use the Old Testament responsibly? I would say yes. But then the question is, if the New Testament uses the Old Testament responsibly, but it doesn't always use the Old Testament in the most straightforward way, then how is, in this case, the Old Testament actually being used? And then once you figure out how the Old Testament is actually being used in this particular passage, even if it's in a way that's different then maybe just like a proof texting, right? Like the Old Testament said this and this happened, right? Prediction fulfillment. Even if it's being used in a different way, but if we can really figure out how it's being used, it begins to unlock the entire message of, in this case, Matthew, in a new kind of way. And so what I want to look at here is why in the world is... Matthew in the birth narrative, uh, why is he quoting Hosea chapter 11? Uh, what's, what's going on? What's he really trying to say? And so just brief review, Michael did a great job in our uh, first lecture of just ways that the Old Testament is used in the New Testament. Just to give you kind of a framework, so anytime you come to a passage in the New Testament, and you see a quotation of the Old Testament, there are really four main categories that you have to ask yourself, how is it being used? And it, it really helps to have the categories in place because then you can kind of take, as you're studying the New Testament, you can take the quotations of the Old Testament and say, okay, where does this fit? What's being said? And I don't claim that these categories are absolute. You know. I take these from a guy named uh, Dr. Michael Rydelnik. He's a Jewish studies professor. Some scholars, they come up with like 10 categories, some like 15, and it can get very, very like fine-tuned, right? But just for starters, I think it's good to have four main categories in place when you come to the issue of messianic prophecy. And the first is very simple, which is just a direct fulfillment of a direct prediction. And I'll go into these more on the next slide. This is the most basic kind of prophecy we think of. Prophet said it was going to happen. It's fulfilled. It happened. Uh, the next is a, excuse me, I'm drinking kombucha. This is, <laughs> it's really good. What was that? It's fizzy. The next is obviously a, a typological fulfillment. So something in the Old Testament, a type, a person, a place, an idea, it's a foreshadow of something that the New Testament authors draw on. Uh, the next could be a summary fulfillment where uh, 
New Testament authors, they don't quote any one particular passage, but they make a reference to the holistic teaching of Scripture. And I'm going to explain these more as well. And the final would be application fulfillment, what I would call almost like a midrash, where a New Testament author takes an Old, uh, Old Testament theme or an idea or a verse, and they kind of apply it to their own situation, similar to what we do when we read the Scriptures devotionally. And we say, you know what I mean? Like, God spoke to me through this verse. And so it's helpful, as we'll see, especially when we get into Matthew chapter 2, uh, verse 15, it's helpful to have these categories in place to start kind of analyzing then, okay, how is he using it? And what of the claims that Matthew is irresponsible with the Old Testament, which you'll hear if probably more from Jewish people who are more highly educated, um, this would be one of the arguments that they'll throw in there. Michael Brown in his book, Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus, he talks about Matthew chapter 2 because they'll kind of try to throw this in there sometimes like uh, they weren't using the Old Testament based on what it really means. Okay, so direct fulfillment obviously when the Old Testament predicts a specific event in the future that is not fulfilled until the time of the Messiah, there's one prediction by a prophet and one fulfillment in time. And there could also be direct prediction and fulfillment within the Old Testament, like Jeremiah predicting the Babylonians would come, prophesying that the Babylonians would come. And so these are obviously the most straightforward messianic prophecies because, and for me, I think they have the most apologetic weight in Jewish evangelism because you're looking at something that was predicted obviously hundreds, thousands of years before it happened and then you see it fulfilled in the life of Yeshua and you know that the mathematical possibility of that happening is not as likely in the life of anyone else. So just, what did I put here? Oh yeah, okay, I already covered that. Just examples. Anyone, what would you say were your like top three prophecies of direct prediction, direct fulfillment? Anyone can just, yeah. How much he's going to be sold for? The pieces of silver. I actually didn't put that one in here. Okay. Virgin birth. I, I believe it's in either Psalms or Zechariah. Yeah. Right. Any others? Isaiah 53. I would. I'll, I'll go through. Isaiah 53 would be the biggest one for me. I see someone. Is that a copy of Isaiah 53 explained? Yeah. I work with Chosen People Ministries, and we do this big Isaiah 53 campaign because Isaiah 53 is one of the most compelling direct prediction, direct fulfillment in the life of Yeshua, there's a story of someone taking that and putting it on a, a piece of paper with no verse notations and taking it to their work and then going around and asking people, Jews, Gentiles, secular, religious, asking people, who does this talk about? And like the majority of the people will say, oh, it's talking about Jesus. It's from the New Testament. And really it's like, no, that was actually written hundreds, 700, 800 years before. So you have these. These would be my top ten. Isaiah 9, 6, the birth of the child who will be divine. Uh, Micah 5, 2, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, which Matthew quotes in, in Matthew 2. Genesis 3, 15, the Messiah defeating evil uh, through suffering. Genesis 49, 10, the Messiah coming through the line of Judah. So all through Genesis narrows down the seed of the woman that culminates with the tribe of Judah and then on through David. Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19, that's a really good one. Anyone know what that is? The rejected prophet? Yeah. 
the prophet like Moses. And um, I think I put this in there later, but if you want a really good example of Jewish evangelism in the New Testament, go read Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7 because Stephen lays out this whole thing and his, his climax or his one point of his sermon is taken from Deuteronomy 18 that just as they asked for the prophet and Moses was rejected by the nation, so too Yeshua the Messiah, the prophet like Moses, was also rejected. So this is a, this is a big one as well. Zechariah 12.10, they will look on me whom they have pierced. Psalm 110, anybody know the most quoted uh, messianic prophecy in the whole New Testament? Psalm 110, the enthronement of the, the king when he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Peter quotes it, Yeshua quotes it of himself to show that he's greater than David. And uh, I believe Psalm 10, also, 110 also has the priestly, the Melchizedek. So you have the king, priest, powerful. I put 10 of Daniel 7, 9 through 14. Anybody know what Daniel 7, 9 through 14? This is one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. He sees the Son of Man come up to the Ancient of Days and he's dressed, you know, in glory and the Ancient of Days gives him the kingdom over all the kingdoms of the earth. There's a guy named uh, Daniel Boyar, a, a non-believing Jewish scholar who wrote uh, a book mostly about Daniel 7. And this is a non-believing Jew who's saying, based on Daniel 7, Jews should be perfectly fine with the idea of a divine Messiah. Because the whole point of Daniel 7 is that this divine Son of Man figure is receiving the kingdom of the Ancient of Days, and who is king but God Himself, right? And He says there were thrones set up. And so Daniel 7 is a powerful one. When they asked Yeshua in the Gospel of Mark, the high priest asked Him, "Are you the, tell us plainly, you know, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? He said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So, Yeshua, every time he called himself the Son of Man, probably drawing on Daniel chapter 7 to show that he's this heavenly pre existent figure. And finally, Zechariah 14, 1 through 4, which talks about the second coming and his feet standing on the Mount of Olives. So for me, if I were a. Uh, let me see how we're doing here. If I were discipling a Jewish person or trying to lead a Jewish person to faith, and um, that's part of why we want to do these yeshivas, just to give some tools, I would stick predominantly to these because these are some of the clearest direct prediction, direct fulfillment. I mean, it's hard to argue around a lot of the message that's being said in these verses. You have the divinity of the Messiah. You have the suffering of the Messiah. You have His resurrection. You have His first coming, second coming, king, priest, prophet. It's really all there. And if any time anyone has any questions or anything, feel free to um, stop me. But I wanted to put these because these are my, my top ten of Jewish evangelism. And you can do a lot with these in Jewish evangelism. Question. Yes, sir. Uh, back to What's that? Uh, back to Daniel 9. Yeah. Daniel 7? Um, sorry, yeah. Daniel 7. Okay, but Daniel 9, the seven week prophecy. Right. Also. Yeah. I just mentioned these because these are a little more straightforward. I mean, once you get into the, uh, the 70 weeks and the timelines and where does Daniel stop talking about the Greeks? You know, where does he start talking about the end of days and the Antichrist? 
I think it has probably less uh, immediate evangelistic value because Paul, when he preached the gospel in uh, Corinthians, he said, I delivered to you what is of first importance that the Messiah uh, that you know, died for our sins. So I want to keep kind of more to the, me personally, I mean, I think all those scriptures have a lot of value, but me personally, I want to keep more to what is a simple, compelling gospel message from the Old Testament about uh, stressing the substitutionary atonement, the resurrection, Yeshua's divinity, and His second coming. And so that's the only reason I put these. There's, there's others. And then when you get into typology, whoa, sorry about that. When something foreshadows a later occurrence in redemption history, especially in the time of the Messiah, so I'd say these have less evangelistic value, but more theological value. And I'll explain that a little more. Because they demonstrate the harmony between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and they demonstrate that Yeshua is the climax of Old Testament revelation. And it can be more fluid, and I'll, we'll get into some examples. But there's a difference when a prophet says, Isaiah 53, that the Messiah is going to come and He's going to suffer for our sins and then be raised up. There's a difference between a direct prediction versus something that looking back, I can later see a connection to Yeshua. Like, uh, let's look at some examples. What's the first one I put? Adam. You know, in Romans 5.14, Paul says that Adam, he literally uses the Greek word uh, typos, a type. He says that Adam was a type of the one who was to come. And so, Adam was a type of the Messiah. Well, how was Adam a type of the Messiah? Well, Paul's whole argument in Romans 5 is that through the actions of one man, sin came into the world. And so through the actions of one man, God brings redemption to the world. So Paul says clearly, Adam was a type. But if I were a Jewish Israeli living you know, back in 1000 BC, I probably wouldn't have been thinking of Adam as a as a type of the Messiah to come. It's something that only in later redemption history, God gave revelation to Paul, and Paul looks back, and Paul draws a parallel. So I wouldn't use that. I mean, you could use that in Jewish evangelism. It's still important, but it doesn't have the same weight to me as saying, look what God predicted of the Messiah thousands of years. And then there's others. The tabernacle... The whole book of Hebrews is about showing how the tabernacle, the sacrifices, the priesthood are all typology. They're all representations of something that would come into fullness later. Passover and other feasts, we obviously know that when Yeshua used Passover. Oh, and this is what I was mentioning earlier. Stephen says in Acts 7 that Moses was a type of the Messiah because he was a leader of the people who was rejected. And Stephen's, what got Stephen stoned is he basically says, look, Moses was a type of the Messiah. Then Stephen quotes Deuteronomy 18, and he basically says, just like your people rejected Moses in the wilderness, the Jewish leadership, you rejected the Messiah. And, and that was like too much for them to handle. So he uses, Stephen uses Moses as a type of the Messiah. Babylon and Revelation, the old kingdom of Babylon is uh, seen as representative of this end, end days. This is what we're going to get into in Matthew uh, chapter 2. The nation of Israel was actually a type of the Messiah in a certain way. All right. And anyone think of any other types, as it were, anything that you think foreshadowed the life of Joseph I've heard before. A lot of really good typology in the life of Joseph. What's that? The whole thing of Joseph. The whole thing of Joseph. Yes, the, the fact that Joseph from Jesus that, that those two. Right. 
but Right. So, Genesis 22. Right. Yeah, Genesis 22 is a great one of God providing. So it's it's all over the uh, it's all over the Old Testament. It's just a matter of trying to get some categories to have to be able to put them in, and uh, I'll show you why I think it's important to have those categories. Yes, you had. What's that? Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's absolutely everywhere, and and I don't want to. I'm not for a minute implying that these are irrelevant for a Jewish person knowing. I go and do Passover seder's um, all the time in churches, and I've used types of Joseph before in evangelism. I just kind of look back at my uh, ten years or so of doing Jewish evangelism, and when I lived in Israel, and sometimes I look back on how I would share the gospel with Jewish people, and it was kind of very muddied, and like I was talking about the Passover and Joseph, and it was kind of all over the place, and I wish like, why didn't you just say, read Isaiah 53, read Isaiah 9, read Daniel 7, read Genesis 3, Genesis 49, you know, um, so I'm not for a minute saying these are irrelevant, it's just we all have to make our decisions, I guess, of how we choose to uh, present in evangelism. And, and um, what we're finding, for example, with our Isaiah 53 campaign with Chosen People is that those direct prophecies carry a lot of weight with Jewish people and there's a lot of interest um, being generated. And then I'll get through these next two just pretty fast because they're less important uh, for us today. Summary fulfillment, when a New Testament author doesn't quote one passage, but references like the whole teaching of the prophets per se. So Paul does it here, or Peter rather. The prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Messiah within them was indicating as He, the Spirit of God, predicted the sufferings of the Messiah in the glories to follow. So Peter clearly understood that the prophets knew uh, that this was like the twofold gospel that the Messiah would suffer. Um, and Paul does it again here when he speaks of, I delivered you what was first importance. Messiah died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and was buried, and He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures not giving us any individual verse, but kind of a collection. Matthew does it here. Yeshua and his family went to live in a city called Nazareth. And then he says, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. Notice how he says plural. It's the first place in Matthew where he references the plural prophets. And then he says, he shall be called a Nazarene. Nowhere in the Hebrew Bible does it say that Yeshua will be called a Nazarene. Nowhere. So people will say, ah, you see, Matthew, he's making stuff up. Uh, he's not responsible. But he says he's, he's summarizing the view of the prophets. And I think what's probably happening here is Nazareth was a despised place. You remember in uh, John, I think it's Nathaniel who says, can any good thing come from Nazareth? So when Matthew says he shall be called a Nazarene, I think Matthew is summarizing the Old Testament view that the Messiah would be despised. Maybe going back to the Moses typology or Isaiah. I don't know exactly where he's getting it, but 
he's summarizing the teaching of the prophets. He's not giving us chapter and verse. He's just assuming this about the Messiah. A Nazarene, yeah, the Nazarene vow. Yeah, I don't think that Matthew is talking about Yeshua taking Nazarite vow. There's no, I mean, you can search your Old Testament, go on Bible software and look for, he shall be called a Nazarene. It's not in there. And so you have to come up with another way to say, well, what's he doing here? Right, yeah, Nazarite. Yeah. Yeah, and then you have uh, the Netzer, which is like the branch. There's all this branch theology in the Hebrew Bible. Some people connect it to that. It's, uh, it's controversial what, what Matthew is saying here um, because you never see this quotation. All I'm saying is you never see the quotation in the Hebrew Bible because he says the prophets, plural. He's not giving you a direct quotation. He's summarizing summary fulfillment. He's summarizing the teaching of the prophets. That's all I'm trying to uh, point out. And then application is like when a New Testament author takes something from the Old Testament and then applies it to their current circumstances. Uh, it doesn't mean that the Old Testament was predicting that, but they're just kind of, it's showing you how they did their devotions essentially. So a really good one is Paul in Acts after the Jewish leadership rejects the gospel in Acts 13. Paul says, For so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. And what's really interesting is Paul's quoting Isaiah that originally talked about the Messiah, but then he's applying it to himself. And so it shows you how the early followers of Yeshua, how they interacted with Scripture in their everyday lives, how we would say, you know, the Lord has given me this word from the prophets. Or, and we take something from back then, and it doesn't mean that it predicts our life circumstance, but we're just applying it. And uh, you see this in different places. Here's a good one. Paul uses this twice. Uh, oh, no, not this one, but... Here he's quoting about the whys and the one I wanted to get to. When Paul's making a case for why preachers should be paid, he, said, he quotes the Torah. It says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he's threshing. And that's from, he does it in Timothy, 1 Timothy and 1 Corinthians. And so Paul clearly, he's just drawing a principle from the Old Testament and applying it to his own life saying, listen, when animals were working, they got to eat. You didn't muzzle them. While the ox was threshing, it got to eat the grain. So Paul is saying, you know, anyone who preaches the gospel and does the work of the gospel deserves to get paid. So Paul is applying something from the Old Testament. And this is just kind of review uh, from what Michael really covered a couple months ago. And so I wanted to get into, once you have those four categories in place, you come back to Matthew, you know, this very interesting passage in Matthew where he quotes and says, Yeshua was under threat of persecution, under threat of being killed by Herod. And then he quotes Hosea and he says, this was to fulfill what the prophet had said, out of Egypt I called my son. Now here's where the problem comes. It's not really a problem. Anytime there's a problem, it means that you're on the way to getting probably a deeper answer. Because here's Hosea 11, 1 through 6. When Israel was a youth, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So who's Hosea talking about? He's, he's talking about the nation. He's not saying anything about the Messiah. And then he even more proves, he says, the more they called them, the more they went from them, they kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning incense to idols. Yet it is I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. 
I led them with cords of a man with bonds of love, and I became to them as one who lifts the yoke from their jaws, and I bent down and fed them. So the question is, why in the world is Matthew, you know, if you think Scripture is inspired, I believe it's inspired, I believe God is highly intelligent, why in the world is Matthew quoting a passage that talks about disobedient Israel that when Israel was a youth, so a young nation, God loved them, chesed, covenant love. And he says, out of Egypt I called my son, which is a textual reference if you want to turn to Exodus 4.22, where Moses is talking to Pharaoh, and he says, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, Let my son go that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son and your firstborn. So the idea of Israel being God's son and firstborn is connected to the idea that Israel is God's privileged nation among the nations, right? It's not just that God literally begat Israel, but it's saying that God called Israel his son because God adopted them, took them under his wing, and made them his people in a kingdom of priests. And so when he's saying to Pharaoh, out of Egypt I called my son. And so in an ancient Near Eastern context, the firstborn son, or whoever had the right of the firstborn, you see it sometimes in the Bible being flipped, but whoever had the right of the firstborn had the special privilege of the father, right? And that's what all the bickerings about in the Torah between all these. So God says, among all the nations, Israel is my firstborn. Israel is my privileged people. Israel is my son. They have the, the inheritance above all the nations of the earth. But then he says, the more basically God tried to work in Israel's life, the more Israel committed idolatry, right? So they're, burn, they're worshiping the golden calf. They're burning incense to Baal. Uh, and God is saying, I was your father. You were my son. I did all this for you, and yet you totally forsook me. And so again, the question comes back. If Matthew is a Jewish scholar, why, why is he quoting Hosea 11 why is he quoting a passage which talks about the disobedience of Israel? Why is he applying it to the Messiah? He could have quoted thousands of other scriptures. He could have done a lot of other things there, but he, he, you know, he knows Hosea well. He knows how people are going to hear this, and they're going to say, because when you quoted a verse back then, you're invoking the whole passage, Right? So a Jewish reader back then, they're going to hear this and they're going to think, Hosea 11, disobedient Israel, right? And so the question is, why, what is Matthew doing? Why, why is he using a verse that talks about the disobedience of Israel and spinning it around and saying it somehow relates to the person of the Messiah? So go back and think of our four categories. Direct prediction, direct fulfillment. Clearly, this isn't a direct prediction. How could I read this as a direct prediction of the Messiah? Because he's not saying the Messiah is going to go down, live in Egypt, and then come out. And so a lot of people, to defend Scripture, they might try to go that route, but actually miss what's being said. What, what's being said by Matthew is actually... It's actually quite beautiful and powerful. And if you don't grasp what Matthew's saying at the beginning of the birth narrative, you miss in the remainder of the Gospel of Matthew, especially 2, 3, and 4, you miss how he's trying to show the Messiah in relationship to Israel. Uh, that's, that's what I would argue. And so let's look here. That's something very interesting. Numbers 23. 
Yes, question? Okay. But yeah, if anyone had a speculation or thought, I mean, I'm more than... Because I think what Matthew is really doing, I think it, it fits into the category of typology. So the reason Matthew is saying Yeshua goes down, lives in Egypt, and then comes out of Egypt, who is he's trying to make a connection between Yeshua and the people of Israel, right? He's trying to make a very intimate connection, almost trying to say that some people have said Yeshua is the personification of Israel. So Yeshua, as it were, relives the experience of Israel that Matthew wants to show a solidarity between the Messiah and the nation. And, uh, you know, from Vladimir's message, it's, it's a point well taken. It's right here in all of the, uh, the Christmas texts, you know. And last year, Tali and I, we were at a church for a Christmas service, and the guy, he was giving a Christmas message from Luke, and I just remember he didn't say anything about, uh, he didn't say anything about the connection between Yeshua and his Jewishness or Yeshua and the nation of Israel. He didn't go into any of this that's here. And, and for Matthew, I would argue Matthew is trying to make the strongest possible connection between Israel and the Jewish people possible, which is why he quotes Hosea 11. And Luke doesn't. I, th I think it has to do with audience because... Yeah, Luke was writing to a predominantly probably Gentile, Greco-Roman audience. So he wanted to present certain details of Yeshua's life. And then Matthew is writing to a predominantly Jewish audience. A lot of people think uh, Matthew came from like a Messianic Jewish community in Syria, you know, somewhere northeast. And so Matthew more, has more of a priority to show that Yeshua is in solidarity with Israel, that he's the Jewish king, that he's the fulfillment of the Hebrew Bible, whereas Luke wants to show more that he's the savior of all people. And so it doesn't mean that, well, they're picking and choosing basically in the same way if like we went outside and saw a car accident and then the police came up to you and said, what did you see? And he asked me, what did I see? We could both tell the truth about the same event, but we would pick certain details based on our own perspective, based on our own agenda, whatever you want to say. And so, what? Angles. And so, Matthew, the reason Matthew is so important is because he's building this case of Yeshua is the Jewish Messiah, the Savior of Israel, and not just the Savior of Israel, but that he is in unity and solidarity with his people. And so if you go to Numbers uh, 23, this is where I think you really have to, to see it in your own Bible, because I didn't put the slide up there, to really connect where Matthew's going with this and where he might be drawing from other Old Testament scriptures. Uh, Numbers 23. Anyone know what Numbers 23 is? The Balaam Oracles? Well, there's this really interesting facet of the Balaam Oracles because he almost repeats himself. And so this is in 23, 21, talking about Jacob. He says, he has not observed misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Here it is. God brings them out of Egypt. Plural. God brings them, the nation of Israel, out of Egypt. He is for them. Plural. He is for them. He is for the nation of Israel like the horns of the wild ox. 
For there is no omen against Jacob, nor is there any divination against Israel. At the proper time it shall be said to Jacob and to Israel what God has done. Behold, a people, plural, rises like a lioness, and as a lion it lifts itself. It will not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Okay, then if you flip over to Numbers 24, you probably don't have to flip. Balaam starts saying almost the exact same thing, but with some interesting changes. He says, How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens beside the river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. Water will flow from his buckets, and his seed will be by many waters. And his king, who is Israel's king? Who is Jacob's king? The Messiah. And so he's pointing back to earlier prophecies in Genesis. He says, His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. And then here Balaam shifts and he says, God brings him out of Egypt. That's Numbers 24, 8. God brings him, singular, out of Egypt. Who's the him? Who's the singular? He is for him like the horns of the wild ox. He will devour the nations who are his adversaries and will crush their bones in pieces and shatter them with his arrows. He couches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who dares rouse him. Blessed is everyone who curses you, and cursed is everyone who curses you. And there Balaam, I believe, is talking directly about the Messiah. And if you go down in the oracle, uh, Balaam says later in 24, 16, or 17, he says, I see him, who's the him? but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. A, sh a scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down all the sons of Sheth. So when Balaam sees Israel coming out of Egypt, Balaam simultaneously has a future revelation of the Messiah because remember, again, going back to Genesis 3.15, the identity of the Messiah, the seed of the woman, with the nation of Israel is inseparable. The whole reason God made Israel a nation in the first place was for the sake of bringing the Messiah into the world. And so when Balaam's given a revelation, he sees this terrible people that you dare not confront, blesses everyone who blesses you, curses everyone who curses you. Balaam sees prophetically, he sees the Messiah among his people. And so he sees him coming out of Egypt, as it were. And so going back to all this, uh, Hosea chapter 11 and Matthew chapter 2, what is, what is Matthew really doing here? Well, it seems to me that based on Numbers 23 and 24, and then if you also look in Isaiah... 43 through 49 in the servant songs. And just before I, I go there, the Old Testament prophets, they understood this. They understood that the Messiah and Israel are almost like equal and one and the same. So they understood that the nation of Israel is a type and a foreshadowing of the Messiah to come. You see the, the connection there in the Baalim oracles? So Israel being the son of God, when he says, I'm calling out my son and my firstborn from Egypt, Israel being God's son and firstborn is a foreshadowing of the Messiah who would come. Because what do we call Yeshua? He's the son of God. He's, he's the one who's privileged above all others. And that's part of where the, uh, the typology comes from. It also happens in Isaiah. Um, how many of you have heard sometimes people will say, Isaiah 53 is talking about the nation of Israel, not the Messiah. Anyone ever heard that? 
Well, yeah, I personally believe that. Yeah, I just personally believe that the solidarity, the overlap between Israel and the Messiah, it's already there in the Balaam oracles. When, when Balaam sees Israel, he sees the Messiah. And the same thing in the servant songs of Isaiah, what actually happens is if you go back to the beginning of the servant songs and say Isaiah 43.10, God says to Israel, you are my witnesses, plural, declares the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am. Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. And then if you look in 44, Isaiah 44, 1 through 3, he says, But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord, who made you and formed you from the womb, who will help you. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant. And I'll skip down uh, to 3. And he says, I'll pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. So there are clearly places in the servant songs of Isaiah where the corporate nation of Israel is being addressed as God's servant. But then what happens as you go on and you read the rest of the servant songs, basically the whole point is that Israel failed to fulfill their duties as God's servant. So then God takes the national calling of Israel and then He bestows it on the individual. And that starts around Isaiah 49. So Jewish people are actually right to say that in Isaiah, the servant is actually both. The servant in the beginning of the servant songs is the nation of Israel. But then when you go to Isaiah 49, he says to the Messiah, you are my servant Israel. This is 49.3. In whom I will show my glory. And then if you skip down, he says, Isaiah 49.5. And now says the Lord who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him. So, earlier in the servant songs, Israel is the servant. By the time you get to 49, there's another servant, and he's saying, you're my servant to actually bring Israel back. Well, how can Israel bring Israel back to itself? So there's the transition there. But for our purposes, I'm just trying to show in Numbers 23 and 24, and in the servant songs of Isaiah, there's already the solidarity between Israel and the Jewish people is all over the Hebrew Bible. Does that make sense? And so, when we get to Matthew chapter 2, verse 15, where he's quoting Hosea, talking about disobedient Israel, they went down to Egypt, and then he says, this was fulfilled, what was spoken through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. What Matthew's doing is he's showing that Israel is the typology of the Messiah in the Old Testament. And so Israel's pointing forward uh, to the person of the Messiah, but with some key differences. So now what Matthew wants to do, now that he has the solidarity pinned down. He wants to show in the rest of the next unfolding chapters, he wants to show that Israel is almost the antitype to the Messiah. Um, in literature, it's called like a foil character. It's like the opposite character. And so he's showing that as God's truest son, the Messiah is the one who's turning the clocks back on all of Israel's failures. And so why does, it, why does Yeshua go down and live in Egypt and then come out of Egypt and then Matthew quote Hosea 11, which talked about the disobedience of Israel? Because Matthew wants us to see that in the same way that Israel went down and came out of Egypt and failed at every single point. Remember, 
So Israel came out and failed. Matthew is now saying, now God, Yeshua goes and relives the experience of the nation. He stands in solidarity with his people. The patriarchs went down to Egypt, sojourned in Egypt, and then they eventually came out to the promised land. So Yeshua goes down to Egypt, lives in Egypt, and then comes out and then goes and lives in Nazareth. And what Matthew is trying to say is, Hosea 11 is being reversed in the person of the Messiah. Israel's record of disobedience is actually being washed away, and now there's going to be a, a new history for the nation of Israel through the person of the Messiah. Now that's really powerful preaching. That's like really powerful stuff. And so this is right here in the birth narratives, the Christmas story. You know, it's all there, this intricate solidarity between Yeshua and his people, and that Matthew's trying to say, this is the one that our nation should hope in because he's the one who has the power to stand in solidarity with us and wash away our history and wash away our record of disobedience. So a Jew in the first century reading this would be haunted by the record of Hosea 11 because we went down to Egypt and God chose us and we failed over and over again. We failed and committed idolatry. The golden calf, Numbers 25, right after the Baal oracles, they're committing idolatry again. So this is the record of sin which haunted the nation. And so what I'm trying to show is that Matthew is, he is such an intelligent, selective interpreter of the Hebrew Bible. And he's taking passages from Hosea and passages from Numbers and passages from Isaiah, talking about the solidarity of the servant with his people and showing how the servant is the one who's going to reverse it. But how could he reverse it unless he went down into Egypt and relived the gauntlet of Israel's own trials and tribulations. So just concluding, what further evidence is there in Matthew that this is in fact what Matthew is trying to say? Well, if you go to Matthew 2.13 with being baptized by John the Baptist, where Yeshua says, Yeshua goes to John to be baptized, and John tries to prevent him, and John's not having it. He says, I, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? And then Yeshua says, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Why in the world is Yeshua being baptized in the baptism of John, which is a baptism of repentance from sin? Yeshua had no sin. Even John understood what his baptism was about. He says, my baptism is a baptism of repentance for sin. I'm out here calling Israel to turn, and you're the Messiah, and you're coming out to be baptized by me? And then Yeshua goes into the water, and then he comes out, and then what does God say? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is my true Son. So Yeshua, just as in Numbers 23 and 24, just as in the servant songs of Isaiah, He goes to be baptized by John to identify with the sins of Israel. This is Yeshua's, I can't even say it's His first act of substitutionary atonement, because His first act of vicarious or substitutionary atonement is that he goes to relive their experience and then he comes out and then he goes through the waters of their sin just as Israel went through the waters of the Red Sea and then came to Sinai and so Yeshua goes down and then God says this is my true son and you see so the whole idea of Yeshua being the son of God as we speak of him it's all based on the typology of the nation of Israel. It's all based, everything that Yeshua is and everything that Yeshua fulfills is based on His solidarity and fulfillment of the purposes of Israel.
And so then what happened to Israel after they're at the mountain? God says, you know, it's time to move it on, and they're not ready to go, so they wander around in the wilderness. And then so if you go to Matthew 4, where's the next place that you see Yeshua in his life before he starts his public ministry? He's in the wilderness, being tempted by the devil. Every single quote, when Yeshua quotes from the devil to rebuke him, every quote, almost every quote, depending on how you read uh, the Old Testament text, every single quote he quotes from the book of Deuteronomy, the book that's recounting Israel's history of failure. And so Yeshua then, he goes down to Egypt, he comes out, identifies with their sins, and then he goes into the wilderness and he identifies with their temptation in the wilderness and he identifies with their struggles. And so again, Matthew's point is that this is our champion. This is our savior. This is our redeemer. Yeshua purposefully goes into the wilderness. Matthew even says that he was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. You know, I want the Holy Spirit in my life, but, (laughs) you know, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And then he's out there rebuking the devil from the book of Deuteronomy. And the question again is, is why is he doing this? Because he's reliving the experience and the failures of Yeshua at every single point in his life and he's turning the clock back and he's reversing their history. And so it's a uh, it's powerful gospel preaching. When I when I wrote my conclusions and my thesis on this uh, verse I said, you know, Matthew is like the Jewish evangelist of the highest order. This is some of the most beautiful, hope-filled gospel preaching to Israel and the Jewish people in all of the New Testament. This is highly contextualized, highly specified, highly focused on giving Israel hope. And, uh, you know, it's just beautiful to me. But if you, what I'm trying to show in our yeshiva is that if you don't go back to Matthew 2.15, out of Egypt I called my son, and really try to hunt down why is Matthew quoting this verse? What is he saying? He's, not, he's making a theological point, not just a historical point. As was pointed out, he doesn't just care to say, you know, these are the historical facts of Yeshua's life. He's strategic in quoting Hosea, and it's not until we really start hunting down and analyzing and looking for why are the New Testament authors using these quotations? And sometimes the answers like this, they're a little complicated. And most people, uh, they'll be prone maybe just to write Matthew off and say, oh, he's just proof texting. He's just grabbing something from here because there's like a similarity. But when you really stop and look at it, uh, the New Testament uses the Old Testament so faithfully and so ingeniously. It's... Uh, it, it's absolutely inspiring, and it's powerful preaching. Another point I made just as I wrap it up was, and uh, when I wrote my thesis on this was, how could Christians or anyone fail to see Yeshua as the greatest advocate of Israel? It's ironic because some people will actually base their replacement theology on verses like this because Christian scholars, they, they see the connection that Yeshua is fulfilling the history of Israel, right? So they develop like a fulfillment theology and they say, therefore, uh, well, it, Jesus has kind of replaced Israel in their mind, right? Just like they'll take from certain letters in Paul and they'll say, the church has replaced Israel. Well, they'll use passages like the Gospels and they'll say, not only has the church replaced Israel, but the Messiah has replaced Israel because he takes what was theirs and he relives it. But I'm saying, I'm thinking to myself, this should actually fuel hope and evangelism for the Jewish people 
more than anything, this should not be seen as relegating the Jewish people in any way. This should enforce the idea that now that Yeshua has come, there is more hope for the Jewish people than ever before. And that's what Matthew's trying to say. Now there's more hope for us as a nation, not Yeshua's coming to abolish the nation or to fulfill their, their calling and reject them, but Yeshua's coming to be the example and the savior of the nation. So I've always puzzled how people could uh, read the Gospels and fail to see that Yeshua is first and foremost uh, a sign of God's faithfulness to the people of Israel. And it's... a uh, it's really heartbreaking that most Jewish people and most Christians would actually not, they don't actually see Yeshua in that way so intricately tied to his people. But it's, it's all here in the Gospel of Matthew, and we could go on and uh, you could kind of use this lens through the whole Gospel of Matthew, looking at Yeshua as the Moses and the deliverer with the Passover. This is like Matthew's fundamental truth that he's building his whole picture of Yeshua on is this connection with uh, the Jewish people. So I just wanted to kind of slow down today and talk about one verse and really dig in and talk about it in context to show how we can um, use these kind of truths in evangelism and to reinforce our own views and understanding of, of what God is doing today. So I'll kind of wrap it up there. And if anyone has any questions, I went just over an hour, so I want to be respectful of your time. So thank you all very much. For more information, visit us at www.etzheim.org. That's spelled E-I-T-Z dash C-H-A-I-M dot org or join us in Richardson, Texas for our weekly Shabbat services.